The final chapter of Jujutsu Kaisen just dropped and man, this was controversial. A lot of fans are mad and disappointed with the ending and with the final chapter and social media is absolutely flooded with claims that the JJK ending could be the worst shonen ending ever. Is this really true? Is it really that bad? Or is this just more Twitter brain rot? Let's break it down right now. You guys know the drill. If you enjoy my JJK videos, leave a quick like and comment for that YouTube algorithm. And I think I'm going to have to do at least one other big video on JJK talking about its ending and how it relates to the rest of the story. So if you want to see that and you don't want to miss it, definitely subscribe and hit that notification bell right now. In the last chapter, we finally stopped talking about how the Sukuna fight went, and we got a sneak peek into the lives of the sorcerers after that massive fight. We also learned that the culling game did come to an official end after Sukuna's downfall, although it wasn't made clear how exactly that happened. We were under the impression that the culling game is this supernatural trap that the players couldn't get rid of, and yet in the end it ended as basically an afterthought to the Sukuna fight, with hardly an explanation for what happened and how. We saw Megumi and Shoko paying respects to Megumi's late sister Tsumiki before Megumi went off on a mission and Shoko seemed to have finally quit smoking. We also learned that the absorbed vestiges of Tengen were still left inside Sukuna's remains after they were ripped from Megumi and so Tengen's barrier over Japan should continue to hold as long as these remains are preserved. That said, the barrier won't last forever, so alternate plans and countermeasures have to be implemented soon. Now, since Megumi survived being possessed by Sukuna, the sorcerers would attempt to save everyone else who was possessed by incarnated sorcerers from the past as a result of the culling game. However, because Mio and Daido are incarnated sorcerers who helped the modern sorcerers during the culling game, Maki unofficially advises them to head into Tokyo and hide out. If they don't want to be exercised from the bodies that they are currently possessing, Tokyo is the place to go because it is still off limits to the general public, so it should be relatively safe for incarnated sorcerers, at least for now. We also got to see the mangaka sorcerer Charles Bernard working on a one-shot manga, which was a pretty random scene that just kind of was thrown in there, I don't know why. We had Tabata discussing his comedy routine with a partner whose face is hidden but who has the exact same hairstyle as Geto slash Kenjaku. Many fans speculated that maybe Kenjaku somehow came back to life and decided to start hanging out with Takaba for fun. But if you're hoping for a confirmation or definitive answer of any kind from the final chapter, spoiler alert, but sorry to say that you will be disappointed. Then we saw Rin Amai apologizing to some guy he bullied in high school or something and the guy didn't accept the apology. After after that, we learned that Higuruma would not be prosecuted for killing a bunch of people during the culling game because the sorcerers wanted to use him from now on. So they applied pressure to the legal system not to pursue charges. Yay, justice and stuff. After that, Angel narked on Hana Kurusu by telling Megumi that she has a crush on him. Megumi said he would take responsibility for Hana and be her right hand from now on, but he got flustered when a wedding was mentioned. The rest of the chapter focused on a new mission that Yuji, Megumi and Nobara were sent on. A woman thought her fiancé was cursed because his face started looking weird, but it turned out that she was the one who was cursed instead. A curse user deliberately made it so that she would see her own fiancé as a goofy 90s anime character even though everything else around her seemed perfectly normal. The chapter ended as the trio set out to find this curse user, who didn't seem to be actively dangerous since he wasn't trying to harm the victim. Megumi speculated that he might be just some awkward guy who survived the culling game and gained curse powers. And I speculated that this guy was probably in love with the woman and he was trying to get her to break up with her fiancé by making him look goofy. Spoiler alert, I was mostly right. The final chapter begins with Nobara, Yuji and Megumi working to solve that case of the creepy curse user stalker guy. Nobara says that since she couldn't find any sort of curse seal or marking on the woman who is being affected, this means that the curse user has to be somewhere nearby. Realistically, his range is likely around 50 meters, maybe 100 meters tops. As long as they can get the victim out of the curse user's range, everything should go back to normal. The big problem is that they are now in the middle of a big city, and there are thousands of people around that 50 to 100 meter range, and since there are many buildings in the area, it is very easy for the curse user to stay hidden. Yuji suggests luring the curse user out to an open field, and then pouncing on him when he comes out and shows himself. But Megumi points out that this strategy would only work if the curse user turns out to be extremely dumb. Nobara suggests that Yuji should just pick the victim up and run away with her, which would then force the curse user to chase after them and show himself. But again, Megumi points out that the curse user doesn't have to chase them. He knows where the woman lives, so he can just wait for her to come back and then activate his curse again. Yuji then has another idea, which is to send the victim and her fiancé on a paid expense trip, but Megumi suspects that the curse user's technique allows him to find the woman's location 
So even that strategy is not likely to work. And of course, the cursed user could just wait for the couple to come back from vacation and just start everything again from the beginning. Nobara and Yuji are annoyed that Megumi just keeps shutting down all their brilliant ideas, but Megumi has an idea of his own. They will take the couple up on the top floor of a 40 floor condo, which is over 150 meters in height. This means that just by moving up inside the building, the victim will leave the cursed user's range. And then when the cursed user tries to make his move to get close enough to reactivate the technique, the sorcerers will spot him and take him out. The cursed user seems to stalk the victim 24 hours a day, so if he thinks that she is just going into the building to visit a friend or something, he won't suspect that the sorcerers are looking for him and he will come out of hiding and reveal himself. To no one's surprise, they decide to go with Megumi's strategy, and once the victim and her fiancé reach the upper floors of the building, she notices that her fiancé's face has finally gone back to normal. This means that the sorcerers were right. The cursed user has a range of around 100 meters tops, and as soon as the target leaves that range, the effects of the curse technique are nullified. And the sorcerers were right about more than just the range. They were also right in their guess that the curse user was stalking the victim 24-7, and when she moves out of his range, he climbs the roof of one of the smaller buildings in order to try to get back in range. But even though at first they think that capturing the stalker will be a piece of cake, once the curse user uses his technique on them, they become distracted by each other's goofy appearance that makes them look like gag characters from retro anime. The stalker looks like he's about to get away, but he wasn't counting on Megumi, who quickly takes the curse user down with his divine dog totality. The sorcerers handcuff the stalker and bring him in front of the victim, asking her if she's ever seen him before. She says that no, she doesn't remember ever meeting him, which absolutely infuriates the stalker. He reveals that he was the one who bought her expensive purse that she is currently holding, and that is when we learn that the woman in question works as a hostess at a cafe. The stalker was someone who went to that establishment and developed an unhealthy parasocial obsession with the hostess, which is why he started buying her gifts. But the woman has had so many customers over the years that she doesn't even remember this poor simp. And so, the final mission in JJK, the main focus of the final few chapters of the manga, ends with the capture of a curse-using simp. While the simp waits in the back of the car to be taken away, Yuji decides to go up to him and give him a bit of a pep talk, because I guess he feels bad for the guy. He tells the stalker that he's not gonna get executed or anything, and the stalker does finally take responsibility for his actions. He admits that he was blaming the woman for his own problems and projecting his issues onto her. This leads us to a quick flashback during which Yuji and Gojo are talking about switch training. Gojo says that sure, it will be fine for him and Yuji to practice switching bodies, but he also tells Yuji that he wants him to be more forward thinking. Gojo says that sure, he wants Yuji and the other students to carry on his dream if anything should happen to him, but if he does end up getting taken out by Sukuna, Gojo wants the students to grow further than he ever did. He doesn't want the others to just keep thinking about Gojo and keep trying to imitate him. He wants them to forget about him and develop strength completely different from his own. Yuji says that none of them would ever forget Gojo, and he is surprised that Gojo doesn't seem like his usual self. He's not as cocky and confident as he normally is, and he even seems to be a little timid. Gojo just laughs and says that this is true confidence, confidence like he's never had before, and he tells Yuji that he's expecting great things from him. After this nice little flashback that shows us that Gojo had tried to prepare Yuji and the others for the possibility of his death, and that he even tried to motivate them to move past his death and become even stronger and better than him in their own way, we return to the present time. Yuji tells the stalker that hey, at least he took responsibility for his actions and admitted that he messed up. That is the most important step. And Yuji even says that after taking some time to reflect on his actions, the stalker should join the sorcerers on their next mission. Then he says the same thing to the stalker that Gojo had said to him. I'm expecting great things from you. Well, this was weird to say the least. I mean, I kind of get what Yuji is doing here. He's trying to be more mature and motivational like Gojo was. But I mean, Gojo was Yuji's teacher and he knew him well. This guy is literally some obsessive stalker that Yuji just met. And he's already acting like the two of them are friends and like the stalker is ready for his redemption arc. I'm not saying that redemption arcs are bad or anything, but this is just way too quick and sudden. Really strange choice for Yuji and of course for Gege, especially in the final chapter of the entire series. Nobara then asks Yuji what he did with the final Sukuna finger, and Yuji says he just threw it away. This obviously surprises both Nobara and Megumi, but Yuji explains that the finger is not dangerous anymore. Now that Sukuna is gone for good, 
The finger is nothing more than a talisman, a harmless object that just looks cool and creepy. At the end of the chapter, we learn where exactly Yuji tossed the finger, but before that, Sukuna returns to the story along with Mahito. Yes, that's right. Sukuna's soul meets with Mahito's soul, or I guess you could say the vestiges of their soul meet in a sort of purgatory world. This world is referred to as the path souls walk on their way down the cycle. The cycle here refers to the cycle of reincarnation in Buddhism, and because Sukuna and Mahito are both villains, they are almost certainly going to be reincarnated as lower life forms in their next lives, such as animals, hungry ghosts, or residents of the various Buddhist hells. Mahito greets Sukuna, and he is surprised to see the King of Curses here. He wishes to ask Sukuna a question. Was he lying after all, to himself and to everyone else? Was he lying about living his life according to his own desire, unburdened by an external force. Mahito believes that in reality, Sukuna sought revenge against those who resented and persecuted him, those who saw him as a cursed, unwanted child. Now this hints at some potentially interesting aspects of Sukuna's backstory, like some terrible things that he went through as a child that turned him into what he became, but unfortunately, we still know very little about his backstory and how he went from a regular human to the King of Curses during the Heian era. We also don't know how Mahito would even know the details of Sukuna's backstory if even those who shared a body with him like Yuji and Megumi don't, but... I guess he does. I really wish we would have gotten more info about Heian Sukuna and his backstory, some sort of epic flashback or even a JJK Zero type prequel, but sadly, we never got it. Sukuna doesn't really know the difference, because whether he was after revenge or not, he still lived in the only way he knew how, and that is how he wanted to live. But then Sukuna rethinks that statement. He reveals that he actually had two paths that he could have traveled, and then we see an image of Sukuna at a crossroads between two paths. One of the paths leads to a woman dressed in traditional Japanese clothing, and presumably this is like someone Sukuna could have married and had a normal life with, maybe even Yorozu from back in the day. The other road leads to what appears to be a young Uraume. Sukuna says that he couldn't help but spit out the curses stirring deep within his viscera, and that he feared his own curse would emulate him. Again, this is very interesting stuff, but we don't get a lot of explanation here. He just kind of moves on. Interestingly enough, he adds that should there be a next time, like a next life, perhaps it would be nice to walk a different path. And as he says this, Sukuna has his hand on Uraume's shoulder as she cries. Mahito mocks Sukuna, saying that the other path would be so boring and that he's gone soft, but Sukuna replies... Obviously, I lost, after all. This infuriates Mahito because Sukuna seems to have matured and grown as a character by the end of the story, whereas Mahito has remained a sulking child, and that is the last we see of the two villains. Honestly, I feel like there is a really good Sukuna backstory somewhere in here that should have been fleshed out a lot more. But, unfortunately, this just isn't enough to really understand what Gege is trying to say. It's all too quick. My guess is that Uraume represents the path Sukuna took in this lifetime, because she was like a fangirl of his who did everything for him and enabled him in his obsession to be the strongest and destroy every challenge in his path. The other woman, the path he didn't choose, might have represented just a normal life. The path he could have taken if he decided to just get married, have a family, and abandon the idea of being the King of Curses. I am just speculating here because as I said this is so vague and so rushed, but that is my best guess because Mahito calls this second path boring, and if the second path is just a normal family life, then yeah, Mahito would think it's very boring. The final pages show the young Jujutsu sorcerers just going about their lives, looking content for the most part, and the very final page reveals where Yuji tossed that final finger. He left it in the same place that he found it at the very beginning of the story, that creepy wooden shed slash thermometer box close to the school. And with that, the story of JJK comes full circle. The final page includes a thank you from Gege for reading JJK for the past six years, but unfortunately, it does not contain any sort of setup for a sequel or some other continuation of the story. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't get one. Sequels can sometimes come even years later, just look at like Boruto or Dragon Ball Super, but at the moment, for all we know, this could be the end of the entire JJK story. And that is where the real controversy comes into play. Whatever you thought of it, the Sukuna fight was an 
epic and massive event that shaped the story for years. And the aftermath of this fight with Sukuna just feels so underwhelming and anticlimactic by comparison. A lot of things feel rushed, like the end of the culling game and this Sukuna kind of backstory, but not really a backstory. There is still so much more that could have been done with Tengen, Sukuna's backstory, Yuji's parents, and so on. So much stuff was just randomly thrown into those final few chapters, but not fully fleshed out, like Higuruma not being punished, Charles Bernard's manga, Takaba and the Kenjaku doppelganger, and so on. And that final mission was just so incredibly mid. I understand that this mission gives us an idea of how the lives of the sorcerers are going to be from now on after Sukuna, and since Sukuna and all those other villains are now dead, the students are not always going to be destroying powerful curses or defending humanity from existential threats. Sometimes they're just gonna have to help everyday people with relatively minor problems. And that would all be fine if the final chapter announced right away that this was setting up a epic sequel that was coming soon, but if this really ends up being the end of the JJK story forever, then I'm sorry to say that this is really anticlimactic. MHA got a lot of hate for its final chapter, but if I'm being honest, it had a significantly better final chapter than JJK. Without spoiling anything for those of you who didn't read the MHA manga yet, I think the last part of that chapter really pulls out a solid ending and allows the story to go out on a relatively hype note. But with JJK, it's just so underwhelming overall, isn't it? Do you guys agree with me on this? Like, don't get me wrong, I don't agree with those people who are saying that JJK has the worst ending in Shonen, it's not the worst, but it's not great either. And especially these last few chapters. Let me know down below if you liked the ending or hated it. If you enjoy my content, don't forget to like to support me in that YouTube algorithm. And I'm gonna be working on a video that takes a big picture look at why the Sukuna fight was so epic and why the end of it and the ending of the story has been unpopular with the fans. So if that's something you want to watch, definitely subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss it. If you're looking for another epic video to watch right now, check out this video link on screen.